Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to continue our topic of the integumentary system, and we're going to look at the layers that are deep to the epidermis, since we covered the epidermis in the previous video. And those layers are the dermis and the subcutaneous layer, also called the hypodermis, which is not technically part of the integumentary system. So we'll spend most of our time talking about the dermis, and we're going to default to this picture here several times. So the dermis is going to be the layer directly deep to the epidermis. Remember that the deepest layer of the epidermis was the stratum basal. And if you look at the basal side of the stratum basal, it's going to have a basement membrane and deep to that we have the dermis. And so the basement membrane is gonna be a structure that anchors the cells of the stratum basal to the dermis, okay? Now, there's several important differences between the epidermis and the dermis. One is that the epidermis is avascular, whereas the dermis is vascular. In fact, if you actually were to take a, some kind of sharp object and cut yourself, if you did not bleed, then you did not cut into the dermis. You only penetrated the epidermis. Since the epidermis has no blood vessels, it's avascular, you cannot bleed by just simply piercing the epidermis. However, if you take that sharp object and you cut yourself and you do bleed, then you at the very least penetrate it into the dermis because the dermis has blood vessels. And as we'll see, the dermis also has a lot of sensory receptors, it has hair follicles, and it has lots of glands, all right? Now the dermis overall is anywhere between half a millimeter to three millimeters in thickness. And it's composed of two layers. One is the papillary layer. Let's actually blow this up. The papillary layer is a thinner part. It's the superficial of the two layers of the dermis. And then the much thicker part, which is the deeper one, is the reticular layer. We'll go into more details on those in a few minutes. Both of these are composed of what are called connective tissue proper. Uh, we'll go into the specific kinds of that. And within the dermis, you have collagen, elastin, and reticulin, or collagen fibers, elastic fibers, and reticular fibers throughout the entire dermis. There are also motile dendritic cells. Recall that dendritic cells are immune cells that can act as phagocytes to destroy foreign invaders, foreign materials, and basically protect the integumentary system and also prevent those pathogens from penetrating even deeper. So the dermis has dendritic cells that are mobile or motile. And then as I mentioned, the dermis is gonna be rich with blood vessels, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, hair follicles, nail roots, if we're in an area that has fingernails or toenails, sensory nerve endings, and muscles called erector pili, which are muscles that actually cause the hair to stand on end, which is what happens when you get goosebumps. So let's zoom in on this to take a little better look here. So this structure right here, this is actually a hair follicle. Okay, this is our hair follicle, and we see the hair sticking out from that. Now obviously if the hair has to go out and we can see it, it's going to have to penetrate through the epidermis. But overall, the hair follicle itself has its root in the dermis. Okay, so that's where we find the hair follicle. Also, this muscle that we see right here, so there's one right here, and then there's a muscle right here. This is an erector pili muscle. When the erector pili muscle contracts, it causes the hair to stand on end. So not only does this happen when you get goosebumps, but if you actually startle a cat and you see the cat's hair stand on end, that's what's happening, contraction of those erector pili muscles, okay? Also, if we look at these coiled tubes, here's a good example of one. This is called a merocrine sweat gland. And one type of American sweat gland is a regular sweat gland, like when you sweat when you go out in hot weather or you start exercising and the sweat deposits on the surface of your skin. If you look at these glands, they start out in the dermis as a network of coiled tubes, and then it kind of slithers out here through the dermis, through the epidermis, and onto uh, the surface of the skin. These glands that do this are called American sweat glands. Um, they have a duct, as you see right here, and then they have a pore that penetrates the surface of the skin. As I mentioned, merocrine sweat glands produce the regular sweat that we normally think of. We'll talk about those in more detail in a separate video. We also have a special kind of gland called an oil gland, or more specifically, sebaceous gland. 
Sebaceous glands are a little bit different and they're associated with the hair follicles. And what they do is they deposit their secretions directly onto the hair itself, okay? These sebaceous glands do not produce sweat. Instead, as you can see here, they produce oil. And so if you have an individual who has very oily skin, that means there's more activity of the sebaceous glands. And we can also see those sebaceous glands, like the American glands, in the dermis, okay? And obviously what we can see here is there's plenty of vasculature represented by these red and blue blood vessels, and then also plenty of sensory nerve endings. Okay, so all of those things are plentiful in the dermis. As you can see, none of those are in the epidermis, right? Except for some tactile cells in the stratum basal, as we saw earlier. And then the other thing I wanted to mention specifically about the dermis is it's composed of two layers. One was the papillary layer, it was thinner and it's superficial. And then the reticular layer, which was deeper and thicker, all right? Now, I won't spend much time on the reticular layer, but I'm just going to mention one major thing about it. The reticular layer is composed of dense, irregular connective tissue. Dense, irregular. When you have dense, irregular connective tissue, the collagen fibers are arranged in all sorts of directions, not just one direction. If the collagen fibers were arranged in one direction, that would be dense, regular connective tissue, which we find in tendons and ligaments. However, in dense, irregular connective tissue, the fact that the collagen fibers are arranged in all directions allows that tissue to resist tension and torsion in all sorts of directions, not just one direction. And so since skin can be moved in all directions, it requires a much tougher kind of tissue than dense regular. And so the reticular layer is made of dense irregular. Now for the papillary layer. The papillary layer is composed of areolar connective tissue. Okay, so areolar or loose connective tissue as it's called. And it's named for the projections it has, which are called dermal papillae. Okay, so these dermal papillae, you see here, they kind of cause this to go up and down and up and down, almost like finger-like projections. Okay, you could even see that in this micrograph image of the epidermis. Here's one dermal papillae right here. Here's a second one. So these dermal papillae are like finger projections that stick upwards into the epidermis. Okay? And they project through the epidermis and they produce epidermal ridges, which are inconsistencies in the structure of the epidermis. They're most pronounced in thick skin and these epidermal ridges are also called fingerprints. And the unique arrangement of these dermal papillae, which produce unique epidermal ridges, gives each person their unique fingerprint. But those dermal papillae are part of the papillary layer, which gives it its name. Okay, so that's pretty much the major things there are to the dermis. Now, the hypodermis, which is what it's usually called for short, or the subcutaneous layer, this is not actually part of the integumentary system, but it's sometimes associated with it because it lies deep to the dermis. Now, the subcutaneous layer is composed of two types of tissue. One is areolar or loose connective tissue, and the other is adipose connective tissue or fat. Now the adipose tissue is called subcutaneous fat, and overall what this subcutaneous layer's function is, is to pad and protect the body. Okay? The fat in it is mainly what provides the protection, but that fat also does two other things. It acts as an energy reservoir because fat holds triglycerides which can be liberated for energy, and then it also acts as a thermal insulator to help prevent heat loss. In the course of mammalian development, it's deemed important to hold on to heat as much as possible. And so that uh, fat tissue that's in the subcutaneous layer helps with that thermal insulation. Okay? If you need to dissipate some of that heat and get rid of it, you can always vasodilate the blood vessels in the dermis and that will get rid of heat. But it's more important to hold on to the heat, actually, and that's what the fat in the subcutaneous layer does. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you and you learned a little bit of something about the functions of the dermis and the hypodermis. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the next video, we're going to discuss some of the different types of exocrine glands in the integumentary system, and we did mention a few of these. Join us then.